one-on-one -on -one consultation, you know, do everything that we got to do to make sure we answer all those questions. And even if they have nothing to do with cannabis, I will do my very best, you know, to make sure that we can help coordinate care and do anything that we need to do. So, you know, another important thing today, um, thank you for anybody who is perhaps subscribed to my email list at Farm True. Um, if you haven't, just go to our website. Um, under this specials tab, we've got to sign up for our club member program, which also includes getting on our list. Um, and we're sending out daily emails, you know, talking about clinical cannabis and um, really trying to give good, healthy information there. So anyways, the thing I really want to talk about today is cannabis for PTSD, right? And so we did get to actually create a really good guide based off of, you know, the insights from Brian Crum, and he's actually a nurse practitioner out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he is one of the godfathers of medical cannabis here in the state, and, you know, on the laws, writing them, you know, since we had the, you know, Lynn and Aaron Compassionate Use Act, he's a veteran himself, and he's really, 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 you know, studied this, and so, you know, mixing, you know, taking all of his insights from the Harmony Treatment Algorithm, I definitely want to share them with you now, and let you know that they are absolutely available right here on our blog page on farmtrue.care you know and so going through this right talking about the evolution of ptsd treatment you know, ptsd is like a storm you know in the mind born from traumatic events leading to a spectrum of debilitating symptoms which is often fall short in treating this complex condition however a shift is occurring with the harmony method emerging as a beacon of hope in cannabis ptsd therapy and so over here, harmonypsych.org. If you just um, Google Harmony Psychiatric or Brian Crum, you will get, you know, basically all this information that you need to get directed exactly to his website, you know, and talking about all of the Harmony um, Psych algor treatment algorithms for autism. It's really cool stuff there. So definitely want to make everybody aware of that. And we've got links to it in the blog as well. And so, you know, syn uh, synthesizing all of this, I'm going to continue to go through it. The Harmony Method developed by Brian Crum is a significant paradigm shift. Crum's extensive work highlights the limitation of pharmaceutical treatments for PTSD. He emphasizes the role of the endocannabinoid system in PTSD, entomology, and advocates for cannabis-based approaches that restore neurobiological balance. This method diverges from conventional pharmacological strategies by offering a holistic path for healing. Very cool stuff, guys. And you know, going through this a little bit, I will give you some other studies um, outside of you know Dr. Brian Crump to even show you just how much support um, there is in terms of information for this kind of stuff, right? So, continuing on the historical context of psychopharmacology and PTSD, and to understand the significance of the Harmony Method, it's crucial to explore the evolution of psychopharmacology from the torturous practices in the 1700s to the tranquilizing chair of the 1800s. For real, for real. Psychiatric treatments have been marred by a lack of understanding in humanity. 1950s brought psychotropic medications like chlorpromazine, which, despite advancements, often failed to address PTSD's underlying causes and introduced severe side effects. Sure did. So understanding cannabis for PTSD and the harmony method. While PTSD is characterized by dysregulation of stress responses deeply impacting the endocannabinoid system, the harmony method's aim is to realign the system with cannabis therapy at the forefront, reducing symptoms of, across all PTSD structures of feet unachieved by traditional pharmaceuticals. So looking at the step-by-step -step treatment algorithm, first things first, you know, consider um, enrolling in a medical cannabis program and then getting the right strains uh, for relief, right? And you know, now that the uh, state of New Mexico has gone recreational, it's perhaps not as stressed that somebody joins a medical cannabis program, but you're going to save so much money um, and, you know, actually be able to be entitled to higher doses and higher unit limits per your amount that you can shop. So either way, it's still an actual big advantage on top of saving 20% uh, every time you purchase, right? Anyway, healthy diet, organic vegetable, soy, wheat, and corn, considering a gluten-free diet, regular exercise supports your body's endocannabinoid function. Going for a run is absolutely one of the top things you can do to upregulate your own endocannabinoid system. The runner's high is no joke. Fish oil, 2,000 to 4,000 milligrams a day, high in EPA and DHA, supporting depression and mood stabilization. Vitamin E, 400 IUs daily, enhances omega-3's effects and supports endocannabinoid function. 
right? Start with at least 50 billion cultures if you have digestive issues, it aids in reducing inflammation. Um, mindful awareness, practice mindfulness to manage stress. Like, you know, this could be look, looked at in many different ways. You know, mindfulness could include, you know, yoga and meditation, but it could also include, you know, a recommended reading such as A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle, which is a straight recommendation from the Harmony Treatment Algorithm, you know, from Brian Crum. I can't say I've actually ever read that, but I've been trying to kind of practice some of my other mindful awareness stuff, right? Anyways, there's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. Vitamin D3, 5,000 I use daily, especially if you have limited sun exposure. You know, magnesium citrate, 250 to 500 milligrams daily helps with anxiety and insomnia, or with lower doses to avoid digestive issues. And this can also be, right, by magnesium oxide, um, other forms of magnesium salts, you know, that actually just get you to that point of the dosing. So like Magox 400, you know, that's a perfect one um, that actually has good, decent amounts of magnesium in it. And it's a good consistent supplement. Turmeric and black pepper, 500 milligrams twice a day for pain and inflammation. Make sure if you're buying turmeric, it has to have black pepper included in the ingredients label. Otherwise, you're gonna have to be taking pepper with that turmeric, but black pepper really helps to increase that absorption of the turmeric and make sure it's all working right. And on top of that, it actually does help your CD2 receptors, which is just another aside, insane, AKA helping with pain and inflammation as well. Tart cherry juice used for pain relief, especially for gout and arthritis. Um, 5 HTP and B6, starting with 100 milligrams at bedtime, adjusting the dosage as needed. Folic acid, one milligram daily, particularly if you're often out in the sun and lack green vegetables in your diet. Last thing, which shouldn't always be last, definitely, I would say, talk to your doctor first before you start going on your own. But if you're one of those people that you know, really wants that full amount of autonomy, you know, perhaps consider it last. If needed, seek therapies like EMDR, CBT, that's cognitive behavioral therapy or the rapid eye movement stuff or consider pharmaceuticals as a second line of treatment. Well, we talked about enhancing the endocannabinoid system naturally, right? Which was very supported um, throughout this harmony treatment algorithm, but other ways to look at it, right? Towards the end of our therapeutic journey using cannabis for PTSD, it's essential to look at the non-pharmacological ways to enhance the endocannabinoid system. Incorporating root foods rich in essential fatty acids like hemp seeds or flax oil and indulging in dark chocolate and certain herbs can naturally boost the system. Regular enjoyable physical activities, social interactions, and stress reducing practices like yoga and meditation also play a crucial role in maintaining the endocannabinoid system. Well, let's look. Cannabis's impact on the amygdala and PTSD. Research shows that the amygdala, a brain region, my fear and anxiety is significantly affected by PTSD. It's about the size of an almond. You know, cannabis, particularly THC, can help in reducing the hyperactivity of this amygdala, you know, ideally shrinking it, leading to decreased anxiety, fear responses, recurring retrusing, retrusive thoughts and memories, so on and so forth. Right? And that's a clinical, obviously, cannabis-based therapy and method in terms of getting there. But that's also something you can control you know, by literally you know, going through, for instance, your neurocycle um, system there. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about that um, before with uh, Dr. Caroline Leaf, but I would say Google neurocycling if you're looking on you know, finding a different way to manage that on your own, no cannabis included or needed. Cannabis dosing for PTSD, right? So lower doses of THC dominant cannabis can reduce PTSD related anxiety. Well, higher doses may cause anxiety. CBD also follows a similar pattern. Let's start with lower doses and observe the effects on your symptoms. Overall, right, the Harmony Method represents a comprehensive, holistic approach to managing PTSD. It's not merely an alternative treatment, but a complete paradigm shift in understanding and addressing this complex condition. Incorporating cannabis effectively and focusing on lifestyle changes that enhance the endocannabinoid system can pave the way towards a more balanced those struggling with PTSD. As remember, as always, consultation with healthcare providers is crucial before embarking on this healing journey. So, you know. As a pharmacist and also as a cannabis pharmacist and as a healthcare advocate myself, you know, I'm more than happy to help connect the dots for anybody as a part of that journey, even if you just need someone to talk to. I am absolutely here. So I think that's some hopefully some sort of amount of conflict for anybody that is actually listening to this now, right? So, anyways, you know, talking about the amygdala and cannabis and PTSD, you know, very interesting stuff here. Um, anyways, you know, looking at a study, um, here in some PTSD, uh, endocannabinoid system is an important target in treating both anxiety and trauma related disorders due to the high density of CB1 receptors in a brain region called that amygdala. 
and in the sympathetic fight or flight nervous system. The amygdala plays a large role in modulating fear and anxiety, and its response to anxiety provoking cues is, is exaggerated in people with anxiety disorders and stimulating the CB1 receptor via THC can dampen this excessive activity. Similarly, the sympathetic nervous system contains CB1 receptors that will also dampen excessive activity related to the physical effects of anxiety, like those described above, to the related panic attacks. So check this out. The use of THC-dominant cannabis has been associated with both anti-anxiety effects at lower doses and causing anxiety-causing effects at higher doses. Talk a little bit about that. You know, the bidirectional dose response effect on anxiety may be both evident and bidirectional, right, by saying it can be one way or another for THC-dominant cannabis and pharmaceutical-grade CBD. Um, that has also demonstrated similar dose response trends. For example, in one study of healthy subjects, a 300 milligram dose of CBD was associated with improvements in anxiety scores compared to placebo during public speaking, while well, 900 milligram of dose was associated with increased anxiety scores compared to placebo. These doses are not practical or necessary for most people, and the more standard range of CBD dosing for anxiety is 10 to 50 milligrams up to three times a day. And that's likely to help, you know, really reduce that. So anyway, CB1 receptors, right, in the amygdala and sympathetic nervous system can, you know, really control excessive reactivity, anxiety producing cues. You know, taking Motrin, taking your SSRIs, SNRIs are not having any effect on, you know, the amygdala and the actual region of the brain there, you know, talking, um, you know, as the center for PTSD. So anyways, you know, talking about anxiety disorders and, you know, trauma or stressor related disorders, aka PTSD, as closely related as they are, they are still a little different, right? So, you know, PTSD is often resistant to traditional antidepressant and anti anxiety medications, aka SSRIs, you know, fluoxetine, aka Prozac, or anti anxiety medications, whether it's, um, you know, your traditional benzodiazepine, aka Xanax, diazepam or, you know, other, you know, perhaps lighter versions of your anti-anxiety medications, right? Um, in part because the treatments fail to address memory-related dysfunction seen in people with PTSD, such as the ability to extinguish learned fear responses, to suppress the revival of traumatic memories, and to acquire safety signals, and to dampen over-consolidation processes taking place right after re-experiencing symptoms. Cannabinoids are promising in PTSD due to their dual anti-anxiety and memory modulating effects. Animal and early clinical research have produced encouraging results targeting the extinction of fear memories, which could reduce the conditioned fear and anxiety responses triggered by trauma reminders, increasing patients' general ability to actively cope with the trauma without affecting the original memory trace. So for example, here's a story and a clinical story from um, actually a doctor, his name is Dustin Sulak out in Maine. A 34-year-old veteran who was injured by a roadside explosive returned to civilian life with recurrent episodes of extreme distress, most commonly triggered by visual stimuli while driving, such as a red flag tied to the end of a lumber extending from the back of a pickup truck. He explained that every time this happened, he would pull over, take an inhalation or two of THC-ripped cannabis from a pipe he kept in his car and then mediate, meditate excuse me, for 15 to 30 minutes before continuing on his way, assuring, obviously, Dr. Sula that he avoided driving during any potential impairment had subsided. One day, he was proud to report that seeing a red flag on the way to his office visit for the first time since his injury elicited no adverse response. Perhaps his use of cannabis with every trigger in hand for extinction learning, he was able to learn that visual stimulus, stimulus was actually non-threatening. Several human experimental studies have ex indicated that cannabinoids can be helpful in fear extinction. Potential improving benefits of non-pharmacological treatments for trauma like cognitive and behavioral therapies. For example, a single 7.5 milligram dose of THC administered two hours before fear extinction learning compared to placebo resulted in significantly decreased threat responses one day and one week later. Accompanied with functional brain imaging data showed a significant effect on the connectivity of threat detection networks. Another study found that 32 milligrams of inhaled CBD enhanced consolidation of fear extinction learning in humans. Those suggest that cannabinoids both have potential as an adjunct to extinction-based therapies for anxiety disorders. Another thing, among 136 individuals re receiving cognitive behavioral therapies for co-occurring PTSD and substance use disorders, higher cannabis use was associated with greater PTSD symptom severity early in treatment, but lower PTSD symptom severity later in treatment. 
Authors in this study suggested that cannabis may have interacted synergistically with psychological treatment to reduce PTSD symptoms. So anyways, you know, moral of the story there, PTSD is not a one size fits all pony, especially, you know, for every single person in any single, single situation, cannabis can be a potential, you know, game changer for those who have tried everything, especially in the pharmacological side, you've tried all the counseling, you've tried all these things, you know, perhaps it's time to lay off of some of the, you know, pharmacological therapy and look at some non-traditional forms of managing the PTSD, fear, anxiety related responses. And again, I still, you know, highly advocate for, you know, perhaps um, including that with something like, you know, your, your neurocycle, right? Which is a clinically, you know, developed um, situation here. So I'm just showing you guys all this here. Manage stress, anxiety, and depression, and toxic thinking with the first ever brain detox app. This is like, I think probably one of the coolest technology out there that is studied right now. Um, you probably don't see it promoted as much because, you know, things like big pharma, are absolutely going to try to take this thing and you know suppress it so that you can stay on nasty SSRIs with nasty side effects and go down the benzos and whatever else that increase fall risk and decrease quality of life and all that stuff. So, anyways, that's my rant. Um, again, hit me up if you have any extra questions on any of that. Go feel free to go browse our website, so on and so forth. All right, talking in our community spotlight brought to you by the Big Chicken Farm um, Sound Bath. April 11, 2024, $22 donation held at Be Well Regenerative Medicine and Wellness. Uh, um, this, I think, is looks like a really cool event. Doors open at 630, lock 7. Anyways, the Lost Cruise the Sound Bath. A you know, whole lot of cool, holistic amounts of healing there. You know, um, Be Well is an awesome clinic for regenerative medicine. This is definitely, you know, um, the way of the future, in my humble opinion, there, in terms of really getting to, you know, take a good holistic look at patient care um, and primary care and at least supplement it. But if not supplement it, right, maybe perhaps hopefully start incorporating that into a primary care method. So Sheila Bardwell and um, Chelsea over there do a fantastic job and want to make sure that, you know, you've never really thought of anything like this on bad therapy, check it out. Right? And perhaps you have, but, you know, perhaps you haven't. Anyways, yeah, in the last segment, Men's Health Minute brought to you by Vada Speedway Park, talking about what causes night sweats in men. So, man, if you have night sweats, you know, it's not that hot yet if you've been having them in the winter. And night sweats in men can be caused by irregular body processes or underlying health issues. Generally harmless, but excessive sweating could be a symptom of a health condition. Common causes could include testosterone levels, sleep apnea, hormones, medications, and infections. And if they regularly interfere with your sleep, you know, check with your doctor. So, you know, that's my 100% spiel for the evening. You know, there are many reasons that could be underlying for night sweats, but that's, you know, I think perhaps one of those um, almost random to some degree symptoms that could be really prompting a good visit to the doctor, right? Obviously, we know the urologist sometimes gets the uh, primary care, um, you know, job for men because men go to the doctor when, you know, your sexual dysfunction is, you know, starting to peak, right? And things like that. So again, if you're having those prostate issues or if you're having, you know, erectile dysfunction issues, go to a urologist. And of course, all of a sudden you have underlying all kinds of other things. Well, I think this is another one where people might be able to perhaps notice um, some issues with health. So again, go to the doctor and that's it. See you guys.